Hey everyone, welcome to the DLC Drop Podcast. Today I'm excited to have Greg Neal join me. Greg has career building and launching TV show networks from the Oprah Winfrey Network, Food Network, and others. He has a lot of great insights on building teams and insights on leadership. So I'm excited for you to watch this. Let's talk to Greg. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right, Greg Neal, thank you so much for being my guest today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Uh, you and I have a lot of uh, personal background uh, from a professional standpoint, and you are somebody uh, to me who, at a point in my life, well, I was making that turn into the marketing world, and you gave me that stair step from content, production, into marketing. I'll never forget that. And uh, you brought me aboard of the marketing arm. That's right. Which is then uh, GameStop was a client. I went to GameStop. The rest is history, as they say. But I'm excited to have you on and have you share your story and your insights with our audience. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I remember meeting you well, and those are kind words. But honestly, I, I don't think I had that much to do with it. You were a very <laughs> driven guy, and you still are. And you know, look at you now, all the cool stuff you're doing. So... Happy to be here and talk to you, though. Cool. Appreciate that. Yeah. So you've had an incredible career. You've uh, launched eight or nine different uh, TV show networks. You've been VP of creative at the Oprah Winfrey Network. I know you won the Brand Builder of the Year Award for your rebranding work at the Food Network. And you also ran a shoe store. So <laughs> uh, you've, you've done just about everything. But why don't you take take me back to the beginning of your career and you know, take me a little bit through that path and let's dig into it. Yeah, um, that's right. I have, I have worked at a, quite a few places. Um, but, you know, early on, I was always kind of a creative kid. And, and when I went to college, I, I had initially uh, thought I was going to go to law school and, you know, get a real job and got my degree in political science, nothing related to media or marketing or broadcasting or anything like that. But, you know, I was always very creative and when I was in college, I, I worked part time as an, a video editor. I learned how to edit and I was uh, made money doing video editing just to help pay for college and just discovered that I really liked that more than the stuff mm. that I was studying, Yeah, uh, which kind of goes to show you, you know, what you go to college for, unless it's very like specific and niche, like, like a medical science or something like a doctor where you have to right. have that certain kind of training. Um, you know, it doesn't always apply to what you end up doing. I think you kind of find your path and what, you know, it's hard to know when you're 18 or 19 and studying things. Absolutely. Um, but I did know that I wanted to be creative and I really enjoyed making videos and, you know, you're into skateboarding, which I was, all, I, and I was too, and I was nowhere near the, the level of talent you are. I mean, I look at your Instagram videos and I'm like, holy <laughs> cow, man, you Have were, you were, you were really good. Thanks. I, I. I got into a similar action sport, which was freestyle biking, bicycling. Cool, yeah. And uh, there, was a, there was a bike store in Austin. I went to college at the University of Texas, and uh, there was a bike store called Trend Bike Source. And at the time, in the late 1980s, it was the num one of the top freestyle bike companies in America. And, wow. you know, this was when, you know, half pipe riding on, on bikes and Matt Hoffman and guys like that were just coming onto the scene. Yeah. And trend was very, very big into sponsoring contests and things like that. And so I started making videos of bike contests and cool. editing video, just like their skateboarding videos. There were also yeah. ones, you know, they kind of bloomed in the mid and late eighties. And, you know, so I just kind of discovered a passion for it then and then that just kind of led to working at a tv station and mm. then luck of the draw i was i got a job in phoenix arizona and was working at the cbs affiliate there and my boss at the time was leaving and i was really disappointed because i liked him and he said hey i'm gonna move um to knoxville tennessee and i'd like you to move with me and huh. i was in phoenix phoenix was kind of cool very sunny kind of you know, yeah. a, a very cool vibe. And I'm like, Knoxville, Tennessee, man. I'd never even been to Tennessee. And he goes, we're launching this new TV network called HGTV. 
It's all about I've heard of it. deck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I know this is 1994. Wow. So, you know, he goes, it's all about decorating homes and like, you know, landscaping. And I'm like, God, that does not sound very interesting. <laughs> but I liked him and I went and I was one of the, you know, right place at the right time. Yeah. And I was one of the original pl- employees of HGTV. Wow. And helped launch that network and at a much lower level. I was not like in management at that time, but I was a producer there. And then that just kind of led to getting into that industry and, you know, making more connections. And of course, from there, I went to other networks, some of the ones that you mentioned, which sure. we can talk about later if you want. But that's kind of how it started. And, you know, kind of just started with a passion of something that I liked and kind of meeting the right people at the right time. Yeah. And going from there. That's interesting. I can relate to that from the standpoint of just going for it. And I always yeah. say, if, if I'm going to write a book, it's going to be called I'm Going Anyway. Because, yeah. you know, I have, I think, uh, succeeded due to chasing opportunity, regardless of it being a great situation. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes my youthfulness and my my uh, lack of seeing all the negatives and just looking at the positives got yep. me into a rough situation, but then leveraging it to the next thing. And it sounds like, you know, this HGTV situation, had you not jumped from Arizona to Knoxville, which could be crazy for some people. That's right. And it was. And a lot of people gave that feedback. They were like, really? You're going to go to Knoxville like to start a cable network? And this was at a point when cable, there were a few kind of niche cable networks, MTV and CNN with news and MTV with music and lifestyle. But there weren't a lot of, in the early 90s, there weren't a lot of like specialty cable networks like that. Mm. And you know, it's kind of like that saying, like, leap and the net will appear. You know, sometimes yeah. you have to do that. I mean, sometimes you do have to, you know, I always looked at it as um, it's a calculated risk. I mean, you don't want to just jump at anything. But, yeah. you know, I knew that the guy who was hiring me was a good guy and mm. he had a storied experience. I mean, he had a good background, a storied background. And, you know, I'm like, what's the worst thing that can happen? I mean, the worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work out. And right. You just, you move back, you move back to Phoenix or you go back somewhere else. And so, sure, you know, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's a point of no return when people kind of make these, you know, they, they, it seems risky, but it's, it's not really that risky. I mean, it's like, it was just taking a job in a different city, but yeah, people build it up to be very intimidating. Yeah. I can relate. I, uh, with my recent entrepreneurial journey, what's opened my eyes is, failure, if you will, yep. it's not a zero sum game. Yep. It's not like, oh, I'm going to try to do this consulting business. And if it doesn't work, I lost yep. everything. Yep. It's no, I probably talked to a lot of different people who I wouldn't have otherwise. I learned a lot. Yep. It's probably going to be a major step in what I go to next that I wouldn't do had I not had this experience. Yeah. So um, I think the scariest thing about whether it's a new job, a new industry, something is before you make the leap. Once right. you make the leap. Yeah. Then you're just doing it and you figure it out as you go. Yeah, I think if you, you know, there's a great book called The Alchemist by okay. uh, by Paulo Coelho. Uh-huh. Um, and it's a very famous book. I mean, I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. But it's, uh, you know, and, 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 and really it's it's a lot about that. It's a, it's kind of a metaphorical book. It's about a kid who goes on a journey. But the, but the main story of it is, is like you just can't fear failure. If you feel, fa- if you have a fear of failure, you will not make a very good entrepreneur or you will Good not, <laughs> you know, you have to, under, you have to be able to understand that like some things aren't going to work out perfectly. You can't control every aspect of life, mm. you know, right. You just have to be able to, you know, to take the risk and, and do it. And believe me, I've taken a lot of risks that have been <laughs> <laughs> probably in hindsight failures, but you know, they were fun trying. Right. And you know, I'm still alive. I'm sitting here. I'm healthy. <laughs> yeah. Actually my, uh, this summer I was furloughed from PRG, which is a, a company I had before. I was trying to figure out my next step. I was going to pitch a major shoe brand that they should hire me to lead their esports vertical. I was talking to my mom about it. And she said, John, regardless, how fun will that be to try? Yeah. And that was such a mind bender for me because I had never thought about it being fun just to try it and join the process yeah. of going for it and just seeing what happens. And that, that really just, I, w- I think, lowers the bar to enable you just to jump and yeah. go for it. Well, I mean, that's, and that's really good advice for any entrepreneur is a lot of it is in the attitude and how you approach it. 
Mm. Like, so what your mom was telling you was like, hey, how fun it would be to try. And you can look at it as like, oh my God, what if this doesn't work out? Oh my, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose my savings. I'm going to like, how am I going to pay rent next month or my mortgage or whatever? Yeah. The other way to look at it is, what if I do this and everything does work out? And what if I do this and I meet new people or I make new connections? Yeah. You know, so the way that you go into it, I think with a positive attitude, which you've always had, I mean, you've, you know, I've always known you to have a really positive spirit and that, that pays off in the long run. It really does. I mean, you have to think of the opportunity versus like the drawbacks. For you sure. Know? Right. A lot of it has to do that. And most people don't think that way. They really don't. I mean, I've worked with really, really smart people. When I was at Food Network, um, this was like in 2007. I was living in New York City at the time and I was an exec- I was a vice president there. So I was pretty high up the chain. And um, and, fo- and, and at that point, Food Network was doing really, really, I mean, it's still doing well, but it was yeah. really riding high and okay. we were on a crest. And um, I just decided, uh, you know, at that point I had been doing what I would, was doing for like 15 years. And I said, you know, I want to start my own production company. Like I'm tired mm. of working for other people. Yeah. Like I hire production companies that we pay good money to, to do projects for us. I'm like, I could be that guy. <laughs> yeah. I could make that kind of money. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking like, of the potential. And I just put in my resignation. Like I just said, you know what? I didn't have any clients lined up. Oh, well. I knew I knew enough people to probably get clients, but it would have been unethical for me to try to like line up clients while I was working at Food Network. Sure. And I remember one of my coworkers who I, who I liked a lot and she was super smart, but she, and she was also a vice president. And she said, I cannot believe you. She goes, Greg, this is so irresponsible. I cannot. And at that point, my kids were really young. I, I oh, left okay. out that I had two young children <laughs> under five. It's another factor. And, and she's, and my wife didn't work. And, you know, and she's like, I can't believe. <laughs> this is getting worse and worse. I, know, I, know. I think I'm agreeing with I your know. coworker but, at this but point. But she said, I can't believe you're leaving. You know, you've got like a great job. You're kind of, you know, and I was on really good standing with the management. And she's like, you're in a really good place. Like, you know, you know how many businesses like don't make it? And I said, look. You know, this company, you know, I'm loyal to any company that I work for, but it is a two-way street. They don't owe you anything just as you don't owe them anything. It is a contract that you get paid every two weeks or whatever it is. Right. And um, sure enough, a year later when they wanted to downsize, her division got cut and, you know, she was, so I'm not saying don't, you know, if you're working for someone, like don't be thankful for it and don't have an attitude of gratitude. But yeah. you also have to look out for yourself. And, you know, I'm, I left New York and went back to LA and started a company and that's, and it did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what gave me my connection to Oprah because we were doing work wow. and we met the, uh, the initial management team that was starting Oprah Network and they hired me away from there. Mm. And so, you know, one thing kind of leads to another, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the starting the company wasn't the end game, but had I stayed at Food Network, I probably never would have gotten that opportunity to launch the Oprah Winfrey Network. So that's a great point. You know, one thing kind of leads to another, and you've just got to be happy with the path that you take. Well, I think another way that things in a positive way lead to another is how you treat people, the way that people, yeah. people's experience working with you, yeah. developing a network. Um, I try to be very purposeful as adding value to others without necessarily accepting something yeah. in return. If, if you have enough to take care of you now, you can invest long-term in people yeah. in a way. But talk a little bit about um, what you see as some, some positive ways that, that you were able to do it to make, to not burn those bridges and to make those connections and for people at Oprah Network and these other places to say, we need Greg Neal. Well, I think, um, I think a lot of it is common sense. You, you just, you don't separate a job persona from your persona, like what a persona should be in real life. You know, just because you're someone's boss doesn't mean you have to be like commanding and be a jerk and like boss them around. I think you just be a good person to people. And I think that's how you, you know, obviously keep good relationships going Mm. is, um, I think you, you had said it in your, in your question is that, um, you know, offer ways to help people and to be of service to people. I think service is key. And you're not always going to get it back. I mean, sometimes yeah. you're going to be like, dude, that person is, you know, you might think they're <sighs> so unappreciative. I have yeah. helped them get like six jobs, you know, or I have helped them do this or that. And they may not see it that way. And that's okay. Like right. it, you, you can't do it in, in order for recipro. Rest- rest- 
reciprocity. Yeah, but, sort of. um, but I do think that just being a good person, being a smart person, being a kind person, mm-hmm. these are things that are kind of, you know, just obvious in a lot of ways. Sure. But for some reason, like, especially in the media and the entertainment industry, there's a lot of egos and people come and I'm sure, you know, in my past, there are people that would say like, yeah, you know, I'm not that great of a person or maybe I treated them poorly, but it's certainly, I don't think it was intentional. And I think that it, a lot of people, um, let job positions and titles and powers go to their head Mm -hmm. and they become very egotistical about it and they act like they're more important than you. And, you know, it, that's not true. No one is more important <laughs> exactly. than anyone. Like it doesn't matter what your title is and titles are arbitrary and they come and go and you might be the president of a company and then the next year you're not. <laughs> sure. You know? And then you're hoping to find a job is it, whatever title you can get. Right. So. Um, well, I think there's something there that's, um, you know, people, some people don't act the same way in business as you would with people outside of business. Right. Right. With just personal relationships. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can get caught up in a big title or demanding things and see people answer to you and get used to that, maybe. Yeah. I think in entertainment, you have a lot of competition. And so people are just willing to do whatever to just climb and, and also put up with it, right? I mean, I remember I had a job in the past where a line producer was just would just call me and yell at me like crazy. He was a client of ours. And... um I was like, I'm not putting, like, nah. <laughs> That's not how I operate. I don't want your business enough for you to yell at me. I understand you work in Hollywood and probably people are willing to put up with lattes being splashed in their right. face to have an opportunity, but I don't need it that bad and I'm not yeah. going to put up with it. And, and I, he, I think, yeah, we, in business and titles, you become, some people can become this monster that they would never treat somebody that way in their personal life. I know it's, you got to kind of believe in karma that people that act that way that, you know, ultimately, you know, what goes around, um, comes around and, you know, I wish that 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 wasn't true, that people weren't that way, but you know, we all work with people like that and they exist. Um, and I think you're right to have, um, standards and scruples to walk away from things. And, and, you know, you had mentioned, uh, early on some of the places that I had worked and, you know, I know lots of people who've worked at one, you know, which I think is fine, like one place, 10 years or 15 Mm -hmm. years or 20 years, and maybe that's a good fit for them. But when I've ever, I've gotten in situations that I feel like I couldn't, uh, I couldn't change behavior or I couldn't impact culture enough. Mm. I just leave it, you know, and other people might say, gosh, look at his resume. He's been you know, he's been here only one and a half year here, two years or two and a half years here. Like, gosh, yeah. that doesn't seem, but so what? Like it's my <laughs> yeah. life. It's not theirs or it's your life. So I think, a good point. you know, whether you're starting a business or like looking to build your career, it's okay to do what's right for you. If you're a good person and yeah. you offer value and you're good at what you do, people will always want you and they'll value you. That's you a know? good point. Yeah. And there's, there's pros and cons of like, the big business and being an employee of the big company, whether you're in management or whether you're a little lower on the, on the ladder. Yeah. And there's pros and cons of doing your own thing. Right. And yeah. I, as I see it, I like to get your perspective, but the big business reliability, you got a lot of resources, you yeah. got a lot of your taxes and stuff <laughs> are yeah. being done for you. Right. Yeah. Um, on the other side, you have freedom. And that's something that I've loved experiencing is kind of a creative guy, out of the box thinker. And I always found myself, I have so many interests and I see opportunity in a lot of unique ways maybe. And so I would bounce kind of against the guardrails of my role and people above me would say, John, it's here. And I'm like, no, this thing over here, can't you see it? We need to do this. It's amazing. Having that freedom. I enjoy having that freedom. Now it can get a little dicey sometimes without the two week paycheck. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I, um, you know, I've started two different companies. The first one was the one that I had told you about was a, was a production company. And then the second one, when you had mentioned the shoe store was, was, which was, was very much a left turn. And I went from a steady paycheck working at Oprah mm-hmm. and Oprah's, um, mantra is live your best life, you know, mm. and that's kind of like what she goes by and kind of that, that theme permeates, you know, everything 
that yeah. she does. And, and so, you know, we had lots of meetings where that was like a theme of certain programs we were doing or whatever. And I kind of started thinking, um, you know, and it was really tough working there because Oprah, as you can imagine, is a very big brand. It's a very prote protected brand. Yes. It was a grind. It was like a lot of hours. I mean, I, I, awesome, awesome people, sure. great experience, but, you know, was working a lot, was traveling a lot. And I'm like, is this really my best life? Like, I don't know that it is. And mm. so um, I'm an avid runner. And I thought, you know, really, I'm happiest when I'm out running. I know a lot about running. I'm real interested in it. I know a lot about the products and the shoes. And I said, you know, maybe I should just leave and start a running shoe store. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. I, um, I just thought about it and I resigned and, and uh, we were in Los Angeles and we moved to Austin, Texas mm -hmm. and I opened a running shoe store and I did go from that steady paycheck and those insurance benefits and all the things you think of as security. Right. Um, but, you know, I think it's how you define what security is because Absolutely. the truth of the matter is you can have a regular, you have a regular paycheck until you don't. Like if a company furloughs you or lays you off or shuts down your division or right. whatever, it's, it's all mental, you know, it's all mm -hmm. in, kind of in your head and the freedom that you get, you know, you don't have a lot of freedom in a corporate setting. I mean, you can have some, you can carve out some, but at the right. end of the day, you'll always have a boss. And when you right. have your own business, I guess your only boss really would be your customers. But other right. than that, you have the freedom to do things th the way that you want to do. And um, I think both are right answers. I think it kind of depends on what, where you are in your life and what you sure. want. I mean, I'm an employee now of a large company. And for me right now, it, it's, it's good in my life. But I do um, respect and, and appreciate entrepreneurs that are starting their own thing. I mean, I did it. And, you know, I sold, I ended up selling the running store to someone who, was a great steward of the business. I mean, cool. I got it started. And yeah. for me at that point in my life, having that freedom to um, just kind of pursue something that was like fun for me. It was, mm -hmm. it was like a fun job, you know, right now my job is, is I would say is it's fun in a way, but it's also like stressful in a way yeah. in a different type of stress, you know? Sure. So yeah, I, and I don't, uh, you know, want to position it that, you know, entrepreneurs are better than people who work for corporations. What's right for you, right? Yeah. And different seasons of life. However, you make a great point with, yeah, it's reliable until it's not. And I yeah. think that something that people found out during COVID, myself included, yes, is, oh my goodness, this isn't as reliable as you necessarily think. That's right. And you can use COVID as an excuse to say, oh, well, COVID happened. But the truth is, Right. COVID happened. So you have, it, it's steady until it's not, whether it's a, like, it's an unforeseen event like COVID, mm -hmm. whether it is an unforeseen event, like, you know what? We decided we're not going to do digital marketing anymore. Guess what? Digital marketing team, you're gone. Right. And so you always have to, you, you know, again, I, I would, you know, I, I offer this from having been on, on both sides is that it's super important to do what's right for you and not talk yourself out of a situation because of a narrative you've made up in your head. Right. Like when you're doing a pro and con list, should I start this business? Should I not start this business? Well, of course, yeah. doing like pro and con list probably is important, but sure. if you're putting as a con steady paycheck, I'm not even sure that is a con. I mean, I'm not sure mm -hmm. that it, you know, again, it, those are the kind of things that you're kind of like trying to trick yourself into thinking, maybe I don't want to start this business because I won't get a steady paycheck. Well, yeah. maybe the other way to look at it is you won't get a steady paycheck tomorrow, but six months from now, after you've got the business going, not only will you get a steady paycheck, but it'll be triple the paycheck that you had when you were a corporate employee. Right. Right. So and that, your schedule is up to you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Big benefit to yeah. me. I, I pick my son up from school on Thursdays at two o'clock. If I have to take a call or I have to have a meeting, whatever, I can make that happen. But a lot of Thursdays, I make sure after two, I'm with him out on the playground outside yeah. enjoying life. You couldn't do that at a, at a, at a nine to five job. hundred percent. Yeah. So, and then the other thing is simply, I don't know, is, you know, defining what success really means to you, you know, is yeah. success more money. You might not make more money in your own business. Yep. You might have some more freedom. 
you know, and those are, those are interesting things before COVID. I, I literally never thought of having my own company. I did not consider it a possibility. I'm a younger brother. I've always been a great number two supporting the big guy sort of a thing. And when I also remember when I bought a house right before COVID and I remember realizing how much my monthly payments like all together were going to be. And I was like, I can barely afford this. <laughs> and the thought that came to my head was, I need to get a raise from the company that I work for. How can I get them to give me a raise? And now I have this way different mentality on my own business, this kind of hustler's mentality where it's like, wait, if I need more money, I'm going to find another client. or going to find another revenue stream. We're going to develop something that I'm not reliant on one single revenue stream, right. which in business, it's crazy if you're reliant on one revenue stream, but we do it as individuals all the time. Yeah, that's such a good point. The the one revenue um, stream thing. I mean, if you if you're into any type of uh, entrepreneurship or you're into any type of of just really like personal wealth growing, mm-hmm. you know, growing your own personal wealth of investing or whatever, multiple yeah. revenue streams are the key for right. sure. And that's a great analogy to say, gosh, if you had a business and you only had one customer, that was it. That, you know, that customer goes, your business goes. And that's what a lot of people do mm-hmm. with, you know, working at a job is that that's their one, you know, revenue stream. And that's the way it's been done, you know, and you've got to like yeah. be open-minded to, uh, to try to think of other ways to do it. And I think that, um, I think that that's how it, it comes to a lot of people that they don't like, I never thought I would own a business. I mean, I grew up very, like very middle class, mm-hmm. you know, dad worked paycheck to paycheck, Same. Yeah. no, no extra money. Like, you know, knew nothing about investing or the stock market or growing wealth. I mean, yeah, you know, in, in, in part, that's what kind of drove me because I didn't want to end up, you know, everybody has different motivations and you sure. talked about what defines success to you. I would say if you asked me, you know, when I was in college, it was definitely like, you know, to be wealthy and to grow wealth as it is for a lot of young people. Sure. It's very different now what defines success to me. But I do think that um, becoming an entrepreneur and your kind of revelation that like you wanted to start your own business, it it, it comes naturally and organically over time sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes people grew up in an entrepreneurial household and so that's kind of what they know. Right. Like my dad or my parents owned a deli and so I always just knew like (laughs) starting a business. Um, But a lot of people don't know anything about it and it is very intimidating because if you were to ask my father about starting a business, he would have been very negative. Oh, you don't want to do that. You're, you know, 90% of businesses fail, you right. know, or, or saying things like that to kind of discourage me from thinking that way. Right. You know? Yeah. I remember I had a complete different perspective shift. I moved to Orlando my first time out of the house from California. One way ticket to move in with the owner <laughs> of the skate company that I was skating for at the time. And they were extremely entrepreneurial. And I remember at, at some point I wanted to get some t-shirts made so that our, our company could have more t-shirts. And the, my answer was, let me find somebody who I can pay to screen print some t-shirts. Yes. Makes, seems logical. And he said, why don't you buy a screen printer and then you can start your own t-shirt business? I was like, what are you talking about? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever thought of. Ah, it's actually, you That's know, great. depending on the market, that's probably a pretty good uh, way of thinking. And, you know, he was very successful and he was getting into all these other different businesses. His, uh, his brother started a food truck where he would go to all the businesses for lunch and park right outside there. And they had all these, uh, in, you know, these soups, his mother's recipes, mm-hmm. right? From Italy or Belgium or whatever that were, you know, he started this whole business because of that entrepreneurial way of thinking where I came from a place where my mom was a teacher. My dad worked at a factory and it was the furthest thing from my mind right. to, think of doing that, that that's a that's a um that's a good story because it 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 highlights a really important thing for anyone in business well s- certainly for entrepreneurs but anyone in business mm-hmm. is you know that was a meeting a kind of a random meeting in the sense of like you moved to orlando to go with a family that or you know with a guy who started the skateboard company and you know 
you wouldn't have known them otherwise and you met them and you you were exposed to their way of thinking yeah the more people that you know and the more people that you come across that's why networking is so important Mm. because they will expose you to so many new ideas that you never would have thought of had you not moved to orlando even if you stayed sponsored right you may not have ever like thought like it's really not that hard to start a t-shirt company. How many, I mean, how much does a screen press cost? I don't know. Can you right. buy a used one for a thousand bucks? Like you just yeah. need to get the ink. You need, you know, you can read a book on how to screen t-shirts. You get a dryer. Like it's yeah. probably not that hard, but right. most people don't think to do it or have the initiative or drive. And there are people yeah. like that that just have this knack for understanding of like, I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. And there's more opportunity there. And, you know, and that's awesome. Well, and that's a, a great way of thinking too of how can I just figure this out? And, you know, I've talked to, as I started my own business, I talked to all my friends who own their own companies, whether that's consulting or agencies and things like that. They've shared these stories of, you know, when they first got started about, yeah, I met with the client and they asked me to do this thing. And so I went and I learned how to do it. Yeah. So then I could do it for them. Yeah. And yeah, there's some limits on that, of course, yeah. but there's also a... It's a lot of entrepreneurs, whether you're a consultant or a marketer or whatever, it's this perspective and this way of thinking that I can learn what the client needs. Like it, I don't necessarily need to know every single thing today. And you do need to make sure that you're serving them with great, excellent service, right? But the difference a lot of times between that client and that consultant or that marketer is the ability or the willingness just to say, I'm going to go learn what I don't know. Yeah. And this person is paying the person who has that mentality. Right. So developing that mentality can create all sorts of opportunities for you. Is that what you've been doing a little bit? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's (laughs) good. I mean, but you, you can, you know, and it's not saying you're doing this. You can fake it till you make it a little bit. A little bit. Because a little bit of it is being resourcefulness. It's resourcefulness and problem solving. Right. You know, when... And, and there are different types of people that are, that can succeed in starting businesses. There's sometimes there's builders okay. and they, they're just kind of like they, they can build and then they move on to build the next thing, like serial entrepreneurs. Right. And then there's kind of people who build something and then because it's theirs, they just want to stay with it. Like I started this company in 2006 and it's still my company and I'm still doing it. Right. And that's an entrepreneur too, just a different type of entrepreneur. Sure. Uh, for me, what what worked for me a lot was just this idea of building something from the ground up, and then I kind of would move on. Like so, in the television world, my niche became launching TV networks. Yeah, you know, I was involved in the launch of HGTV, but then after that, I went to Fox Family, which is now called Freeform, and was kind of on the launch team for that. Yeah, and then went to another network called Fine Living, and then you know, multiple other ones after that. And so for me, the fun of it was like taking a blank slate Mm. and then just figuring out how it all went together, hiring the team and building the look and feel and all this kind of stuff. And then I kind of got bored once that was set, you know, and then I would move on to the next one. Sure. Right. So I think you got to find like what type of person you are. Are you someone who likes the the constant change? Now, the downside Mm -hmm. of that is, you know, my wife and I, we have, you know, we live here in uh, Dallas now. We moved here about three years ago, but we had spent most of our time in California and New York mm-hmm. moving around a little bit. And this is our 13th house. Wow. So we bought and sold <laughs> 12 houses. This, Maybe that's this, your next niche. This being our 13th. <laughs> and, and so, you know, th- that idea of like moving constantly and starting things also comes a little bit at a personal cost because you have to sure. like, you know, because then you were talking about taking risks and moving, you know, when we were mm-hmm. in New York, like we had to sell our house there and then move to LA. And mm-hmm. then, you know, then we actually went from LA back to New York, sold our house there and went back. Yeah. And it's just a lot, it's a lot to do. But in hindsight, I loved it, you know, and I work with people at my current company that have been there over 20 years. Mm. And I think of where I was 20 years ago. And if I was still in the same place, like for me, I can't, imagine it because I've enjoyed all the change, Yeah, you know, but I think it, you know, there's different, different horses for different courses. Like you've got to figure out what type of business builder are you, you know? Yeah. And I think that gives you, that gives me a lot of comfort, you know, because I I think 
Oh my gosh, if I'm if I have one definition of entrepreneurship and I'm thinking, okay, I got furloughed by my company, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, do my own thing, I'm trying to force fit myself into what I think I'm supposed to be versus naturally and organically letting myself go into the ways that I do go. And for me, it's a robust network, uh, being in touch with a lot of different types of people where yeah. I'm kind of the hub and people come to me and I say, oh, I do know somebody over there. Oh, you need to get in touch with a pro team. You need to get in touch with an esports league or an influencer or, hey, you want to talk to somebody who builds television networks? I just had them on my podcast, yeah. too, right? Um, that's kind of my strength. And you, you talked a lot about building teams. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I had the opportunity to be part of That's right. a team that you were <laughs> you building. Were. <laughs> and when you hired me at the marketing arm, you had just started. And I remember yeah. Noel Upham, shout out. Um, I was interviewing with him. We were trying to find the right place for me at the marketing arm. And he said, hey, we just hired this guy, Greg Neal, and he's going to head up the content studio. Why don't you interview? And so I got to experience you building a team. And one of those things is, uh, I think you were a great leader and you just, oh, you. <laughs> you so inspired me. I still have a lot of those principles that I learned from you. One of them is, you know, you gave me this book, yes, which is, it's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. And not only is this book, I've read it a gazillion times. I even have a little, this is where I'm at now, oh, okay. reading yeah. it again, um, which is on, it's who you know. Perfect, yeah. perfect example there. But um, a great leader Number one, invest in their people. So you are the type of person who's going to give your team books, learn how to be yep. better. Love doing that. I still do. <laughs> Great. And you also, it's there's a lot about getting the wrong people off the bus. Yep. We love them. It's nothing personal, whatever. Yep. But you need to build a great team to do great work. Yep. So talk a lo little bit about your... Uh, your stance on building teams. Well, thank yeah, thank you for saying all that, and and yes, big ups to to Noel, and and thanks to Noel for you know introducing us. Yeah, um, yeah, it it's so much about the people. It's so much about getting the right people on board and the wrong people out. Yes, you know, and and not to use an like a inappropriate analogy, but it's like the wrong person is like an illness in inside your. Mm. It, it is, it is like, it, you know, and, 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 it, and it just spreads because an, yeah. negativity spreads and one sour person can be like, can you believe that Greg guy came in, you know, and yeah. that kind of like boils. And so you, ha mm -hmm. you know, you have to know how to read people. So like reading the room is really important. Like, mm. and that's hard, that is hard to do and it takes time, but you're good at it. I think a lot of, if you're in, if you've built yourself up to a leadership position, I would hope that you have the ability to kind of know, you know, at least instinctively who has, who are the people that have the A, you know, B plus, A minus, A potential and who's yeah. in the C category. Sure. And, um, you know, and it's also, you know, there's a great management adage. There's another great book by John, Jeffrey Fox called How to Be, uh, it's How to Be a Great Boss, or maybe it's How to Be a Good Boss. But it's a fantastic book. And, and it's kind of like the book you just mentioned. It's little short chapters that they're like one and two pages each. And they're really easy. And one of the title, one of the chapters, it's like one page long, is called Hire Slow, Fire Fast. Yeah. So take your time in finding the right people. But if you have the wrong people, do not F around, man. Get rid of them. And so right. when I came into TMA, they they had... um a situation where they had wanted they wanted to build up a, a bigger production department. They were doing some production work, but they kind of wanted to formalize it. And there were some, you know, really nice people that were working in the department, but they were just the wrong people to do the work. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can't, you have to come to the very difficult realization that not everybody can be salvaged and nor should they be. Like right. sometimes you have a great person and they're just not right. They're just not a right fit. And if you want to build it, the way you know it can be successful, it's just like a sports team. Sure. You know? It's just, there can yeah. be good players, but if they're not right for your system, and it's not the right quarterback for your system, you have to cut them. Well, you know? I would say to build on that is if they're, if they're not right for your company, your company isn't right for them either. Right. You know, and but they don't see it that way at the time. Of course. Right. And it's kind of like a breakup with a significant other. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, I have a 19 year old son and he's, he's in college right now. And, 
you know, and, <laughs> going you through know, things. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and he's starting to date people. And like, what I'm trying to say to him is like, you know, if you go on a date and that person isn't, you know, calling you back right away, it's like, it's kind of meant to be, it's kind of like, yeah. it, it, you know, let it you, go. you, yeah, let it go. You may think like, gosh, they're, they're not seeing, they're not seeing how good I can be, or they're, they're not mm-hmm. seeing that. And it's, it's like with a company, it's like, you know, they're mad at the company or you're, they're mad at you, but really at the end of the day, you're not ultimately a right fit. And most people will see it that way later on. They move yeah. on to other things and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and whatever. But um, I can't reiterate enough, you know, and I feel very fortunate. I've been lucky in that I've had really good people drop in my lap randomly. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it's been scouring hundreds of resumes trying to find the right person and talking to lots and lots of people. But when you get the right people, it makes your life so much easier because when you're a leader, when you're an entrepreneur entrepreneur, and you're building a big company, you need to have the ability to delegate. You cannot do it all yourself, nor should you do it all yourself. And so if you have a right, a number two and a number three and a number four that you trust implicitly, Mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about all the time. Yes. Then you know that you're like, okay, this is a good team. And then, right. I, you know, the, the only other thing I would add, you know, and the reason I like giving books is because books often have so many valuable lessons that are so much more eloquent than how you <laughs> could communicate it, sure. right? Yeah. So if they do read it, and I'm sure a lot of people don't read the books that I give them, but if they do, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to learn the kind of things that you want them to be as a person Mm. or be as an employee. And, yeah. you know, I tell this to my kids and I certainly tell it to people that I work with. Like, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Mm. Like, just take the high road and like, you know, be, you know, if you were in a court of law and, <laughs> you know, yeah. someone was saying like how some sort of project went down, if you could say how you handled it and everybody would be, well, that sounds logical. That sounds smart. That sounds reasonable. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's the reaction you know, you want, you don't want to be reactive and you don't want to get caught up in the heat of the moment. Right. Hard to do. I mean, sometimes everybody does it sometimes, but of course, you know, yeah, I've recognized that where I've, I've worked on teams where it's just a players and it's like easy because a lot of the stuff that you shouldn't have to deal with or yeah. figure out or revise yeah. doesn't need revising yeah. because they're at that level. And then you're in this other situation and it's just, you can't get anything done because you just don't have the people to do the job. Right. And I would say too, because uh, I, I worked in the uh, the content studio for about eight months, a short time. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed my time there. But you also, you know, that wasn't also where I was best fit. You know, that wasn't, right. I wasn't the greatest producer in the world. I had some experience. You know, I was learning a lot going from animation to live action. Yeah. But my interest was really more on the marketing side and I wanted to build strategy. And so you and the team at TMA helped me get onto the GameStop team. And then that went onto the client side and stuff like that. And, you know, if I was still at this TMA content studio, sure, I would have learned to be an adequate producer. Right. But I would have not been in my zone where I'm doing the best that I can. And sometimes it takes a while to find that or to help somebody find that's that. right yeah and because sometimes people need a nudge in one direction mm-hmm. and um and i think it's important to to you know recognize when someone can offer value in another area you know and you you move you know you you try to figure out how to move them there right you know and i i've always tried to be um you know you talk about building teams when you build teams not everyone is going to work out like you know right. i've made some mishires over the years everybody makes mishires sure but it's always to be it goes back to the networking thing about being a good person you even if someone isn't a right fit you know you try to like be helpful in how you can help them like right find the right fit for them somewhere else you know right because you never know like you, you you know, we're talking today, but there may be a million ways we could work together in the future. Sure. You may be building some company and you need someone like me. And if I was a jerk to you or wasn't helpful to you, you might yeah. be like, oh, that guy's no, stay away from him. Right. You know, kind of thing. It all kind of and comes back full circle. Yeah. Your reputation, yeah. your, your reputation is important. Absolutely. Um, so. Well, I'd love to take a step back in your, uh, your experience here and um, talk a little bit about going from 
being this person, you were at HGTV to getting into the management side of things. Right. For our audience who, you know, some of them are going to be uh, in that tier of building their career. Yeah. So ha- take me through that where you were in Knoxville and then you end up being, you know, an executive <laughs> of the own network and food network and all of these things. What yeah. was in the middle there? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, it was a, for me, I was fortunate. I think it was a fairly, somewhat of a fairly quick rise in the sense of, um, you know, I was a producer and obviously I think for anyone, um, who wants to rise into management, should that be their interest? A lot of it is a lot of the things we've talked about. You mean, you have to be good at what you do. You have to be like, you know, hopefully you're an A performer in what you do. Um, but you also have to know how it's so much about managing down and managing up Mm. both. And I think that, um, I spent a lot of time focusing on both, like not just how I like could work with my, not, not just how I could like work with my coworkers, but also how I could make sure I offered value to the people that I reported into. Mm. So I became more and more trusted. You know, right. and if you become more and more trusted, then they're like, give it to this guy or this girl. She can, you know, she can handle it. Right. And, you know, from HGTV, I, I went to Fox Family Channel and then, you know, I was, I was kind of a senior producer there. And then Scripps, the parent company that owned HGTV, was launching a new network in LA. And mm. this was in 2001. And because I had helped them launch HGTV, they had given me a call when I was at Fox Family yeah. and said, Hey, you know, Greg, we're, we're going to, you know, they were, they were in Knoxville. They said, Hey, we're going to open an office in LA. Mm -hmm. We're going to launch a new network there. Would you be interested in coming in over to be the creative director? Mm. And it was a network called Fine Living, which was a really cool, relatively short lived network, but it was really cool. And so I I ended up getting that job Mm -hmm. and, um, then used that experience. You know, I stayed with Scripps. They moved me to Nashville, Tennessee, and I helped them launch a shopping channel. Okay. It, and they had promoted me to VP at that time. Cool. And then from Shop at Home, they transferred me up to New York to Food mm. Network. Yeah. And I was a VP of creative at Food Network. Yeah. And so it kind of, you know, a lot of it is all the things that we've talked about. It's networking and constant networking. And it doesn't even have to be networking like blatant, obvious. Cheesy, Relationship building. Cheesy kind right. of like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, like all, like a salesman. Right. It's just staying in touch with people. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, th- this was before texting, but now it's like, I just send text to people. Hey man, how's it going? Right. Or, or if you see something now, it's so easy with social media. You see an event like liking something that they do or saying, Hey, good job. This was really interesting. Yeah. Just being on people's radar is someone who is paying attention to what people are doing and, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and a lot of it is, and this is kind of hard to quantify, but I do think a lot of it about getting into management is somewhat of an X factor because if you, if you take 10 people that are all really good at what they do, yeah. who becomes the manager? Okay. At that point, it's a little bit about their personality, right? Uh-huh. It's like this, they're, they're all good, but this person's maybe the nicest or this person has, you know, is more cutthroat, you know? Right. And then it becomes, you know, who, who would we like to, you know, depending on what your business is, who could, st- who's going to be the best leader in front of clients? Who's going to be the best with customers? Sure. So a lot of it is just about thinking about your presence and who you are, because depending on what you want to do, a lot of times management is much more front facing. You have much more of a target on your back when you're a manager. And so you've got right. to have a lot of confidence. You've got to have a lot of You've got to have a com- somewhat of a commanding presence. Mm-hmm. And so those are the kind of things I think that are important to develop and work on. And I, I always yeah. say reading the room, like it's really important to read the room, to kind of go in and get a sense of when to pick your battles, which I hate using that analogy, but you know what I mean? Like when, right. to, when to speak up and when to listen, right. you know? And these are all things you kind of just learn again by being around and learning from a variety of people. And yeah. for me, what helped me was that I worked at a bunch of different places because I learned instead of staying at one company and only learning uh, from the people at that company, right? you know, you had mentioned GameStop. If I had only worked at GameStop since 1990 <laughs> to now, right. like I would only know the way GameStop does things. Right. If, 
you know, if I had worked at GameStop and then went to Sony and then went to Samsung and then went to Nintendo and then went to Activision, like I would have the perspective of eight different management teams. Good point. And so I'm not saying everyone needs to hop around, but I am saying I think it would be helpful to be open-minded to a variety yeah. of different perspectives. Absolutely. And I think one thing I picked up there is, you know, you're talking about being very front facing. You're talking about managing teams, about managing up. A lot of that has to do with communication. Yep. And I know Warren Buffett said one time, uh, they asked him, what's the most valuable skill you can, you know, develop? And he said, communication. Yeah. The other piece of it, you're talking about uh, reading a room. And more recently, in addition to IQ, EQ or emotional intelligence yes. is one of those things, right? Yeah. How empathetic are you? How yeah. can you relate to the person who's the introvert, but also the extrovert or, you know, you know, understanding somebody and speak into an issue that they're having or also go to the executive or the CEO and be able to, you know, that's a really that important one. EQ. I'm glad you brought that up. When I was at, um, I was at shop at home. I worked, I lived in Nashville for 18 months and it was a shopping channel that was owned by Scripps and the, in the idea, believe it or not, the shopping channel sounds so laughable now when you think of like QVC, but it was like a QVC uh -huh. and it was owned by Scripps. And the idea was to sell things you see on HGTV and Food Network. So okay. Emerald sold pots and pans, HGTV designer couches and stuff. Yeah. And it didn't work out, but I went and helped try to launch this network. And it was on the air for about two years. But my boss at the time was the president, a woman named Judy Gerard, who was the former president at Food Network. And she gave me um, the book by Daniel Goleman, The Emotional Intelligence. Cool. And she goes, I want you to read this. Because mm -hmm. probably at that time, not saying I was lacking a lot of those things, but I was probably much more, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe a little bit more egotistical, a little bit more sure. abrupt. And she said, you know, I want you to read this book. And I read that book. This was in 2005, so 15 plus years ago. And it really changed my life. It changed my perspective. And it's been a 15-year process to kind yeah. of perfect these things. But it's such a good, um, it's such a good gauge. And if you look at mm. like the truly great leaders, yeah, all, uh, most of them, not all, most of them have really high emotional intelligence. Right. You know? What was the name of that book again? It's called Emotional Intelligence. It's called Emotional Intelligence. Yeah, it's okay. by Daniel Goleman. Okay, yeah. cool. I'll have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's... No, um, it's, 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 a, it's a book about it's the entire theory, or maybe it's called EQ. It's, it's Daniel Goleman's book. You, it, you'd be easy to find. You could just type in emotional intelligence, okay. Daniel Goleman. But it's a whole book about the theory of emotional intelligence, having empathy, like caring about people, like right. reading, you know, knowing how to read people. Yeah, you know? I was at a, um, a meeting last night with somebody who's the founder of a, a startup company that I'm working with. And he, we, were, we were talking about this very same thing about the people who are working for him and he's having trouble finding great people, you know, and people who feel ownership over the company and things like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, you know, you got to find the right people, number one, but a great leader inspires, right? Mm -hmm. And you find the things of what motivate, what motivates this person won't motivate this person. I remember years and years ago, I was 19 years old. I was an assistant manager of a pizza place, believe it or not. I don't know who would have trusted me to do that, but <laughs> we didn't burn the place down. <laughs> and I remembered recognizing that, okay, this employee, if I let him make a pizza for himself before he goes home that he can take home, he's going to work so hard yeah. and, you know, finish like through this rush. Yeah. This other guy, I got to threaten him that I'm going to write him up. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't do what he's told. Yeah. And obviously you don't want to, you know, treat people negatively, but different people are motivated in different ways. Yeah. And when you, it's one thing to say, okay, you're working hard for me because I give you a paycheck. Yeah. But if people will work because they want to please you and they take ownership of the company and they say, I believe in this myself, yeah. I feel I want to do it because I want to do it. That's completely different. And then you've got a great team on your hands that you can really do some things with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, that, that's interesting. It is true that different people are motivated. You, you had asked earlier what defines success. I think if you were to ask you know, five people in this office here, you know, they're going to say five different things. Right. And I think it's true of, of, of people that you work with. I, I can tell you for a fact that people that I work with, they will say, when am I going to get a, you know, when, when can I get a promotion or yeah. I want to be a vice president or I want to be a director or, or manager, or whatever the title might be. And it's, you know, my response is why, like, why, why do you want to 
be it. And point. what, why does it have to be this year? Or why does it have to be tomorrow? Or should it be tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Like there's no r- right or wrong answer, but it, but like, it's curious to know people's motivation, right? You know, and if the motivation is just money, it's generally to me, that's the wrong answer. You it's know, typically it's, deeper than that. Maybe they don't recognize yeah. it, but I would also argue that just be purely motivated by money isn't the most healthy thing in the world. At the well, same it's time. not. I mean, I, I it, it's, 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 it's okay to be motivated by getting fair value for what you're contributing to a sure. company, and that may be more money. But if you're just saying, "Hey, I want you know, I want more money," or "I've been here eight years, I need to be promoted," uh, that's you know, that's kind of like the wrong. The, that's not what leadership is. Leadership's not about tenure. I mean, you can be sure. you can be a leader and be like a freshman on the football high school football team as a freshman, like that's your first point. year, and be a great leader. You don't have to be the senior to be the great leader. Right. A lot of times it's about how you, you know, how you influence people around you and how you motivate, you know, people around you and inspire people. And sometimes that goal is the, if you're approaching things the right way, like you're talking about this leadership example, yeah. that promotion or that raise is a byproduct of being a great leader. So, okay, I want to get this raise or this uh, promotion. Well, maybe if I just focus on executing better yeah. or, or leading those around me, that's yeah. going to come. Yeah, it should be. I mean, that that should be. And most of the time, you know, when you give, you know, I can tell you in my experience, at least when I have given people raises or or big raises, it generally comes from the people who never asked for one because the cost of replacing them is so much greater than what I can give them in a raise to make them happy to keep them, you Mm -hmm. know, and you know, because if someone, you know, every once in a while someone comes in and if they say, hey, like, you know, I, I really want to raise... I'm, I would be the first one to say, you know what, like I am, you're, you do deserve a raise. I am sorry. I've not brought this up to you sooner. You're actually like, you know, and hopefully I'm saying that, you know, I'd be telling the truth and saying like, you, you have been on my mind as someone we need to take care of. But yeah, but most of the time, most of the time, like you have to be motivated by like, you know, just doing a good job and wanting to be Mm -hmm. excellent at what you do. Right. And again, like you said, all that stuff is the byproduct. So like all the stuff that you're doing, John, right now, like just creating a podcast and, you know, I've been following the different things that you're doing, all the connections that you make. Like, it's not like you're, it's like, oh, where's the money in all this? But it's going to be a byproduct of it because you're just building something. Like you're building something that's going to lead to something and and it will, it will lead to something. I don't know what that is right now, but like- This is how you make stuff happen. Right. Right. By doing these sorts of things. Right. And I, I talk about, about that a lot because I want to make sure that my motivations are what they should be that are healthy, but also yeah. are, you know, long term. And I talk about that a lot is, you know, when you take care of other people, you look at uh, other people before yourself. You have to be strategic and you have to prioritize yeah. well, but you'll be taken care of yeah. if you're smart about it. Yeah. And it doesn't always have to be chasing that end goal. It's build this thing and, um, you know, you make enough to pay the bills, you make more, that's great, you know, but yeah. do it with great people and enjoy the process of doing it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and, and, um, again, all about, all about connecting, you know, I, I don't know if this is true, but there's kind of like that psychological study where like you're, you're a sum of the five people you hang out with the most, you know, have okay, you ever heard yeah. that? Yeah, you know, or it's kind of like you know, if you start hanging around really negative people or people who aren't very successful, it'll it'll kind of bring you down. And if you're right. around people that kind of lift you up, it'll it'll help you. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really, I, I do think it's really important to try to find whether whether it's mentors, you know. And I'm always seeking mentors. Yes, like you know, I've I've had different ones at different phases of my career, but mm-hmm. just people that you can talk to that have been there before, which is a little bit about what this podcast is about, right? Right. Different perspectives of people who have maybe done different levels or types of achievements in various things and the path that they can go on because that's so important. And, you know, that's what's so great about podcasts is, you know, right now I'm really into listening to financial podcasts because, Mm. you know, I'm not necessarily looking to retire right away, (laughs) but I am starting to plan for like, how can I get there at my age? I'm over 50 now and I'm like, I'm thinking, all right, how am I going to get to a point in retirement? And hearing other people share like their experiences 
makes me think, okay, either I'm not alone or, oh, I never thought of it that way. Maybe I need to do it that way. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> the know. more people you're connected with, the more different perspectives you can learn from and apply those things to your life. Right. Well, um, man, I've so appreciated having you today. Oh, thanks. Uh, this it's conversation <laughs> kind of took some turns that I wasn't expecting. I didn't know exactly where it would go, but I knew at least you know, there'd be a ton of insights uh, for the audience that I would learn from and I know they'll learn from as well. So before I let you go, is there any way you want people to get a hold of you or anything that you want to plug um, before this episode ends? Oh, great. Um, no, not really. I mean, I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a Twitter handle to promote. I actually had at Greg Neal, which is my name forever. And I gave it up and then I went back on and saw like some like 13 year old kid took it or something. <laughs> so <laughs> so my name isn't uh, available, but, um, but anybody that it, it, by any means has any interest in uh, emailing me, that's fine. My email is neiljgn at gmail.com, which is fine. And, cool. and then Instagram, I'm Greg underscore Neil. Mm -hmm. So awesome. that's it. But it, thanks for having me. I, I hope it was interesting. I was joking before, you know, I don't know how necessarily uh, esteemed of a guest that I am, but I, but I have had some interesting places that I've worked. And so hopefully it's been helpful to, to some people who are interesting. I think so. I mean, okay. I loved it from, you know, building teams and insights on, you know, how to go from, you know, trying new things and go from point A to point B, C, yeah. D and, you know, how to be a great leader. I think there's a lot here. Uh, so. Thanks. Well, my parting words would be just what we, what we, to recap it is uh, be fearless and do it with a great attitude and uh, success will come your way for sure. Awesome. That's a great way to put it. Well, thank you, uh, Greg Neal, for being here with me on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future Eye Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.